Well, when we last left off last week, the people in Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, Nazareth, I always have trouble saying that word, Nazareth. The people in Jesus' hometown, they were trying to kill him. Why? Because he interpreted the prophet Isaiah in a way that they didn't necessarily approve of. Yes, the year of the Lord's favor was available to the poor and the marginalized and the outcast and the oppressed, but it was to all of them, not just the people of Israel. And after he escaped, after he escaped Nazareth, those who were trying to throw him off a cliff, he traveled to Capernaum. There's about 62 kilometers on this winding trail a few days away of walking. It's northeast of Nazareth, and it's on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. So in today's scripture, if it talks about a lake and uses a different word, that's what it's talking about, the Sea of Galilee. It has multiple names for it. And once he got there, he went right back to doing the very thing that nearly got him in trouble, going into synagogues around there and preaching. But the people of Capernaum weren't offended by him. They were amazed by him, at least for now. And he even started healing people and casting out demons. The whole region knew about Jesus, this man that taught with power and cast clean spirits. And one Sabbath day, Jesus was leaving the synagogue, and a man named Simon brought him to heal his sick mother. And he did. He went and healed Simon's sick mother-in-law. And people all over were bringing sick relatives to Jesus and people that they believed to be possessed with evil, unclean spirits. And he healed them and he cast out these demons. And the crowds kept coming and coming. And soon began this giant game of hide and seek with Jesus. Jesus would would draw to a deserted, deserted place and the crowds would eventually find him. Jesus wanted to preach, but the crowds, they wanted more. They wanted healing and it was exhausting. He'd withdraw and they'd find him again. But he stayed in that region, preaching in all those local synagogues. And so that is where we are at today when we hear our scripture from Luke 5, 1 through 11. Listen for God's word for you. One day Jesus was standing by Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. When the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word, Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. And Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. And when he had finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out further into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've we've worked hard all night and we've caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. And they signaled for the partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled the boat so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord. I'm a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. I love people. I'm a pretty extreme extrovert most of the time. And Ashley can tell you this, and one of the ways it it presents this is I have this inner drive to always want to be around people, and it usually takes the form of wanting to eat out. There's nothing I love better than eating out with friends, having a good laugh while all of our kids are off in the corner in a restaurant tackling each other. We've made quite a few friends in our neighborhood over the past few years, and many of them have children about the same age as our daughter. A few months ago, we were meeting our friends downtown to have dinner at a downtown restaurant and eat before this big event downtown. We, We convinced Papa's and Beer, the Mexican restaurant downtown, to let us use their party room for dinner in the back. So 12 adults and 15 children between the ages of two and seven crammed into this room at the back of the restaurant, adults trying to have their grown up conversations while also attempting to parent at the same time. You know how that goes. 
So what I was saying is, I really like that book on the educational system that my wife was reading in the book club. Hey, stop it. Stop. This is a restaurant, not a wrestling ring. Yeah, so my wife was reading this book club, and I really like, okay, two hands, two hands, and now we have our first spill of the night. Great. So I really like the way the author used the, the idea of play. Oh, what? You want mac and cheese? Of course you want mac and cheese. I understand. It's, when's it going to get here? I, I don't know. We haven't ordered yet. Just be patient. I know you're hungry. Have you even washed your hands yet? Of course you haven't. All right, let's go wash them. I'm sorry. I'll be back in about three to 20 minutes, <laughs> and we'll finish this 10 sentence conversation that will probably take 30 minutes. In the midst of this chaos walked this sacrificial lamb, a single solitary waiter to try and take our order from this ever-growing minefield of spilled, drink, spilled drinks and games of tag. It's enough to make you want to go and find your happy place and just lay down there for a week. Privacy. That's why the amount of time a man spends in a bathroom is directly proportional to the total number of people that live with him. Each additional family member means about 13 to 18% increase in the amount of bathroom time because it feels like the one place where you can get a little alone time unless you live in my house where my daughter has some sort of parental positioning and tracking system. The system alerts her within two minutes of a parent entering a restroom and in she comes through the door with questions. Ah, oh, the joys of a house with no internal door locks. Jesus was a man in demand, teaching, healing, casting out demons. There's no place he could go where he wouldn't eventually be found. The man needed some space, some quiet time, some room to, to decompress. Good grief, they nearly killed him a week ago. He's got to work on these sermons. He's got to polish that vision, his call to action. But these Galileans, they are cagey trackers. Did you catch that? Jesus would go off in the wilderness and somehow they would search out and find him. They found him standing on the shores of the lake. When they found him there, it was a pretty easy win in the game of Messiah hide and seek. On multiple occasions, the Bible talks about crowds pressing in on Jesus. And this is one of those. So desperate for his attention his healing, that they aren't going to give him any personal space. They're just pressing on him, pressing. Gives you a sense of claustrophobia. It's almost like Jesus in that moment got a little overwhelmed with it all and was just like, enough! You chased me everywhere. I want to teach you. That's why I'm here. But you got to give a brother some space. Now, I'm going to go out in this boat. You stay here right here, and we're just going to go a little bit into the water, and I'll sit down in the boat, and I'll teach you from there. Cool? Cool. But look who's back in the story. It's Simon, the man whose mother-in-law Jesus healed just a little bit earlier. It's Simon's boat, Simon and his partner, those two boats there, and Jesus sits there. He does. He actually does. He sits there in the boat a little bit into the water, and he teaches them. But when he's finished... He says to Simon, take the boat out into the deeper waters. What's important to remember is that Jesus is not catching Simon Peter at the beginning of his shift. He's not catching him on a lunch break or just sitting on the beach enjoying the view. He's caught Simon Peter doing this at the long, fruitless night. They've tried every spot, they've tried every net, they've tried every depth, and they've come up with nothing. The Sea of Galilee has three primary types of fish that Simon Peter and his co-workers would have caught. First was this pan fish that, fish that we now call St. Peter's fish. And then there's a fish in the carp family, and there's a type of catfish they would catch. Ironically, Jews wouldn't eat that because it didn't have scales. The fishing industry in ancient Palestine was completely under control by the Roman Empire. Every drop of water in the Roman Empire was Caesar's. Every fishing hole or great body of water was the state's regulated fishing ground. Some of the fish from 
the Sea of Galilee, they'd be sold locally. But the majority, the vast majority, were salted and cured and pickled to be sent throughout the Roman Empire for the benefit of the urban elite. States like West Virginia, where the natural resources are taken, sold, and transported elsewhere. It's like that. The economy of that region was an extraction economy, an economy of exploitation. Since most of the catch was exported, it left local communities often hungry and poor as Rome collected its exorbitant taxes for every single fish that was sold locally. So in that situation, after a night of failure, an exhausted Simon Peter simply just trusts Jesus about going fishing in the same way that they'd done all night. Jesus didn't ask him to do anything special. Just go in the deep waters, drop your nets. If you were in the shallow waters near the, the shore, you would fish with this circular net that you would cast out and you'd be wading in the waters. There was also a drag net that boats would use that they would drag yards behind them as they sailed along the sea, but more than likely they were using trammel nets, the series of three nets between two boats, and these were pretty good sized boats. Archaeologists have actually found fishing boats buried in the mud in the Sea of Galilee. They were 26 and a half feet long, seven feet wide, and four and a half feet deep. Good sized boats that you could row or sail in the waters. And this catch, it says, is so abundant, it nearly capsized and sunk these rather large fishing boats. And Peter is so overcome, so overcome that he just falls on his knees in the presence of the Messiah, unworthy of being in his presence. Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner, because it's dangerous for us fallen human beings to be in the presence of God. And what I love about this story so much is that it describes failure in a really honest way. We've all had these experiences that we've worked our tails off in a system that has no margin for errors. And just like these apostles, they were trained, they were taught for years to find all the best spots, the good fishing techniques, the best practices, and yet they failed and they were worn out and probably desperate. I think we can all identify with that. We know what it is to pour ourselves into a task, a job, a dream, a relationship, spend hours in preparation and investments only to have it blow up in our face. I was nearly defeated by a garage door this weekend that refused to close. And what's worse is my garage door is a smart garage door that has an app on my phone that keeps reminding me, your door's not closed, your door's not closed. Gee, thanks, Chamberlain. You're very special. Thanks for telling me that. You've made my Saturday wonderful. But I think that's why the story is great. They're failing. And that's the moment Jesus shows up. Not their best moment, not even in a synagogue. At their moment of failure. And these are the men that Jesus calls to be his apostles. You have to remember Simon, Peter, and his partners. They wouldn't have been considered the best of the best of their culture. The mere fact that they were fishermen proves it. This isn't, there's not a dishonor in fishing. It could be worse. They could be shepherds. They were the sketchy ones. They have homes. They have families. The story says Simon Peter's got a wife. From the time they were old enough to talk, Jewish boys would begin memorizing portions of the Torah, being, being instructed in their local synagogues. In each stage of new childhood development, the ones that were worthy, the ones that had a little bit of promise, would go on to the next level of their religious education, memorizing more and more of the Torah until finally the best of the best would have memorized the entire Torah and all the prophets, and a prophet would say, come and follow me. A great teacher would call to them and they would follow him, but that was the best of the best. But Peter and James and John, they're not the best of the best. They weren't following a prophet, they were fishing. No prophet in his right mind would have chosen them as his disciples. I don't know about you, but I've always had these assumptions about the way God speaks to me. Or the way that God sounds when God speaks to me. And I'm struck by it over and over, just how wrong my assumptions are. 
I'm nearly 20 years into ministry and I'm still looking for God in the wrong places and listening to God in the wrong ways. I always expect and assume that God calls and speaks to me in places like this. In holy places and set aside holy times. And don't get me wrong, I've certainly experienced God's movement in my soul during powerful times of worship. But more often than not, God calls me in mundane places, in the task of daily life, in these places that don't especially seem like religious places, mowing grass, doing paperwork, interacting with a coworker, sitting on the couch reading next to Ashley. And so this story is a powerful reminder that Jesus calls us to follow him, not amidst the glory of high cathedrals or holy places. Jesus calls us in the midst of our mundane, ordinary lives, our day-to-day grind. And why shouldn't Jesus call us this way? After all, Jesus is Lord of every aspect of our lives. If Jesus only called us in the midst of our best moments, we'd forget that he's the Lord of our best moments. We were simply called, but you are not simply called in the midst of your ordinary work. You are not simply called away from your ordinary work. Following Jesus takes your ordinary daily lives, your ordinary daily work, and transforms it into a vehicle for Jesus' real presence in this world. Just like Peter and James and John, you are called to transform your work, your house cleaning, your lawn mowing, your dinners out with friends, your text messages, your Instagram selfies, your Facebook posts, your dinner table conversations, your bedtime routines with your children, your tutoring sessions, your teeth brushing, your moments of daydreaming. You are called to transform every moment of your life into an act of discipleship. Because Jesus is in those moments saying, come and follow me. So if we're going to follow Jesus in our lives, we're going to have to do it in whatever situations we find ourselves in. Now, this doesn't mean you're stuck. Stuck where you've always been or stuck where you are. After all, Peter, James, and John left everything and followed Jesus. Maybe God is calling you to a different job, new relationships. But wherever we find ourselves... We're going to have to follow Jesus in the particulars of our lives, in our communities, in our families, in our cultures, in our jobs. Finally, today, I want to talk about that funny little phrase Jesus says. You know the one, the one we've heard so many times, it's lost its strangeness. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. Now on, you'll be catching people, or now on, you'll be fishers of men. Jesus' wordplay seems obvious to us. After all, they just came in from boats catching fish. But there's something subtle in the language that Luke chooses in this story. The Greek word that our Bibles translate as catch is not the same word those ancients would have used to say catch fish. It would have seemed inappropriate to use that word to catch fish. Because to catch fish means capturing an animal for food, for money, for sport. But the word Jesus uses means something different. It means to rescue someone from the peril of death. That's that Greek word catch Jesus is using. The word wasn't meant as an allusion to fishing. It was meant as a contrast to fishing. Do not be afraid. You're catching fish for food. To catch an animal means ending its life. From now on, you are following me, which means you'll be taking women and men alive, catching them, rescuing them from their perilous lives. 
One commentator I read said it this way, the kingdom requires not dead fish, but human beings fully alive, not creatures writhing in their last gasp before death, but people living the life of the good news in all of its fullness. Ultimately, this task of following Jesus, the one that we're not worthy for, the task that calls us to follow in every portion of our lives, the task that calls us even when we've failed and we're out of ideas, this task of following Jesus is oriented toward others. It's not about you. Somehow Jesus made us worthy. Somehow Jesus made us able Somehow Jesus is with us and is continuing to lead. And so he's calling us now in this holy place, but he is calling you in the most mundane thing of this week, calling you to take women and men fully alive into the kingdom of God with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.